What's going on, guys? It is a Wednesday night. That means this is your AEW Dynamite review for Wednesday, November 15, 2023. I am the Sala Monster. We are halfway through the month of November already. Can you believe it? Next week is Thanksgiving. Where is the time going? I thought we were just celebrating Halloween. Now, tonight we were celebrating the... What was it? The, the Like a Boss? I already forgot the name of the game. The, uh, the Gaiden? Like a Dragon. There we go. I like Like a Boss better. So Like a Dragon Gaiden. That was the video game sponsorship. We got a big street fight on the show tonight. Kenny Omega, Chris Jericho, Kota Ibushi, and Paul White. What a motley crew. Big Show and Kota Ibushi as tag team partners. What timeline are we living in? I don't know. But they were in there against the Don Callis family. And we ended up with a bicycle spot. We had somebody riding a bicycle during the match. We had Paul White being body slammed on top of a car. A man who had a, a series of hip surgeries was body slammed on top of a car hood. We had brain busters on top of the bicycle. We had tombstone pile drivers to the floor outside the ring. Moments later, Ibushi springs up like nothing ever happened. And that wasn't even the silliest thing that happened in that match. The one thing I will, I will say about that street fight, I was never bored. So I appreciate that. I, I thought I was uh, thoroughly sports entertained during that brawl that we had between those two teams. But of course, they have a pay-per-view coming up on Saturday. And so the question is, did they do enough to get you interested in seeing at least the key matches on that pay-per-view? MJF is going to be defending the AEW world title against Switchblade Jay White. We also have the women's championship on the line, Tony Storm challenging Hikaru Shida. We have the Texas Death Match with Hangman Adam Page and Swerve Strickland. It's a full card. I believe they have uh, 10 matches announced. Did they do enough to get you interested in full gear? That is the question. I thought that they did a good job with the key matches on the show. There were a lot of matches that were overlooked. I mean, they didn't do anything on this show as far as the Sting, Darby Allin, Adam Copeland, Christian Cage stuff, uh, tag team title stuff with Big Bill and Ricky Starks. They're going to be defending their titles on Saturday. There was really nothing involving them on this show uh, or FTR. Now, they have a three-hour block coming up on Friday. Because they're doing a pay-per-view on Saturday, they're not going to compete against themselves. So instead of airing on Saturday, Collision is airing on Friday night, opposite SmackDown. And then immediately after Collision, they're going to have AEW Rampage. So we'll see what they do on Rampage. For example, we had a great promo from Hangman Adam Page on this show. Quality shit. This man broke into his home. And he came out there and he read the riot act to Swerve Strickland. He made it personal. He showed emotion. He showed fire. He acted and behaved exactly the way that you would expect him to if you were in that same situation. But Swerve Strickland didn't get to say anything. He just stood there and took it. Maybe he'll get his promo time on Friday. That's actually one of the matches I'm most looking forward to on Saturday. The rest of the show, I mean, look, I mean, it was it was okay. Uh, I don't really have a lot of great things to say about this show. I had one person say to me, AEW returned to form like the AEW of old. Really? I, I wouldn't go that far. So there were things on the show that I liked. There were things on the show that I thought were just sort of killing time that didn't really necessarily uh, move me for the pay-per-view or even play into uh, the pay-per-view in any kind of big way. But we're going to go through all of it here, but that's not even... The big news of the day. So we have full gear on Saturday. We know that. Everyone's talking about the devil storyline. No forward movement tonight as far as the devil. If you were expecting some sort of big revelation coming out of the attack last week on the acclaim, you didn't get it. They're leaving you hanging. They didn't really clue us in at all as far as the devil stuff is concerned. But earlier this afternoon, Tony Khan went on Twitter. And Tony Khan posted... The following announcement, let me put the message up that Tony posted. This was at 5.34 p.m. Eastern this afternoon. He said, AEW has agreed to terms with one of the world's best wrestlers 
a pro who is known and respected by virtually every AEW fan. They'll come to LA to sign their contract this Saturday, 11-18 on pay-per-view at full gear. Obviously, this has a lot of people talking about who this individual is that Tony Khan is referring to. Now, I will give you my thoughts on who I think it is and the names that immediately popped into my head. The first name that popped into my head was Mercedes Monet. Now, we have not heard anything on her recovery. I mean, she should be, if, if she's not fully healed, she should basically be at the finish line. She broke her ankle, was it back in May, I think it was. Uh, she should be good to go now. If not now, then shortly. And then she'll make a decision on what she wants to do. Or has she... Ah, oh, 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 the Judgment Day. What else is now? I can't get away from it. The Judgment Day. Interrupting me even on the AEW streams. That's all this fucking group does, is interrupt. Bobbert, thank you for the brand new Judgment Day Super Chat. All they do every single week is just interrupt. But Mercedes Monet was the first name that I thought of. Because a lot of people, you know, even going back many months, figured that this was the place that she was going to end up in. That she wasn't going to go back to WWE. You know, even if she went to AEW, she probably would still be allowed to work New Japan dates if she wanted to or, or stardom, you know, stardom stuff. Um, but that was name number one. Then I started thinking, well, other names, because in the tweet Tony Khan posted, he mentioned a name that every AEW fan respects. And I do think words matter. I do think that it's important to uh, parse through what he said there. I don't know. He said that, and I, it got me thinking, well, maybe he's talking about somebody else. And then it made me think of Will Ospreay. And Will Ospreay has wrestled for AEW. Many times. And Will Ospreay is on record as saying that his contract with New Japan is up in February. He becomes a free agent. And he hadn't made a decision on what he was going to do, but you know, he might go to WWE. He might go to AEW. And I've said, I think AEW would be a great spot for him if he wants to have the ability to still work New Japan. He'll be able to do that. Or even some select independents if that's what he wanted to do. In WWE, he will not have that option. He can get this, but I think Tony Khan would pay him well also. So if it's important to him to still be able to work New Japan, then AEW is the destination for him. But his contract isn't up until February. So is it possible that New Japan was going to let him out of his contract early? Of course not. I mean, he's going into Wrestle Kingdom on January 4th. Why would they do that? So then that makes me think, okay, it's not Will Ospreay. Just because the contract situation is not resolved yet. Then the other name I thought of was someone who got released by WWE back in September. And this is where I think Tony Khan's words really pop into my head when he talks about someone who the AEW fans respect. Every AEW fan has respect for him. And that's Dolph Ziggler, Nick Nemeth. Because I still think that AEW is the likely landing spot for him when his non-compete is up. Problem is, his non compete is not up, as far as we know, until the end of December. So he could be a world's end, which is December 30th, but if he has the same non compete that everybody else on the main roster has, he's not free for another probably four or five weeks. So unless he negotiated some sort of early exit out of respect, they allowed him, maybe he went to them and asked permission and they actually granted him permission to get out of his contract early, that probably doesn't work. But I think he's somebody that would fit the bill as somebody who's very well regarded, very well respected in the industry, even though he's never wrestled a single match in AEW before. So to say that every AEW fan, you know, this is someone they respect, I think is kind of presumptuous, but certainly somebody who is well respected in the business and who I think is going to end up in AEW anyway. The other name that I saw some people talking about, and I would be surprised if it ended up being him, not that he isn't talented, not that he isn't respected, because he is, but I think when you are building up an announcement like this, again, you're setting expectations a little bit higher as far as mainstream names are concerned. 
But I don't think you can discount the possibility of someone like Sammy Callahan. Sammy Callahan is a free agent. So with Sammy Callahan, you don't have to worry about non-competes. You don't have to worry about, oh, he's still under contract. He's a free agent. His contract with Impact ended at the end of September. His name was already talked about. He was backstage in early October at at least one AEW show. John Moxley is a very good friend of his. John Moxley is at least one person who I'm sure would go to bat for him with Tony Khan and say, hey, you need to bring him in. Would Sammy Callahan be that person? It's possible. I just put that name out there. It's not exactly a marquee name in the way that, again, a Mercedes would be or a Will Ospreay would be. But he is someone who's well-respected. He is someone who I think could end up working for AEW. But again, this when you when you make the announcement in advance and you get people talking, again, their expectations are at a certain level. You have to be prepared that there are going to be some people who end up being disappointed. If it turns out to be somebody who, you know, they weren't expecting, who they view as not being as big of a name as some of these other people. So those are the four names. I'm not sure who else it would be. I've seen Chris Hero's name mentioned. Chris Hero's already working for AEW, I thought. I mean, he's been working behind the scenes for them. I mean, to me, that wouldn't be a big deal. Yes, he's well-respected. He just made his return to the ring, I believe. Was it this week or this upcoming weekend? So he's he's back, officially. I'd love to see a Kings of Wrestling reunion at some point, at least once, with him and Claudio. I think that would be cool. But again, he's another one of those names where I think if you're going to go out and, and make this kind of announcement in advance... Uh, I'm expecting it to be somebody a little bit bigger than that. So we'll see. But that got uh, a lot of people on the internet talking earlier this afternoon, Tony Khan and his announcements. So we shall see if he uh, delivers come Saturday because we'll find out at full gear who the person is. But my money, if I had to say, okay, who do I think it is? I'd probably still go back to Mercedes. You know, I still think that uh, she'll end up working for AEW. If not now, probably very soon. But this is your Dynamite Review. Thank you so much for joining me here on a Wednesday night. I hope you guys are having a great one. Uh, like and subscribe. And uh, Super Chats are open. As you saw a moment ago when the Judgment Day rudely interrupted me. Uh, so get them on in. I don't know if the, uh, if the screen is working. So we'll have to see later if I can put them up on screen. If not, I will read them nonetheless. So get them on in. There is that brand new one up there. Also, shout out to Silver Tower, who gifted 10 channel memberships before I went live. And uh, Chris Miner as well, gifting a membership too. Yes, I don't. Mr. Dynamite, I, I am going to safely assume that Tessa Blanchard is not going to be at full gear on set. I do not believe it is Tessa Blanchard. Excalibur, Taz, and Tony Schiavone. Checked in on commentary here to open things up, and they recap the attack that we saw at the end of Dynamite last Wednesday, orchestrated by the devil, whoever he or she is. The attack they orchestrated on Billy Gunn and the Acclaimed, followed by, of course, Samoa Joe walking over up to MJF and laughing at his expense. Excalibur said that security was increased tonight, but anybody associated with MJF potentially could be a target. And Dynamite opened with a tag team match. It was John Moxley and Wheeler Yuta representing the Blackpool Combat Club, taking on Orange Cassidy and Hook. With Hook out first to, surprisingly, a very tepid reaction here from the crowd. Now, maybe it was different in the building, but very noticeable to me that uh, he was not getting much of a reaction, which is kind of startling when you think of the reactions this kid was getting earlier this year, when his music would hit. It was like he was a special attraction. But the more you put somebody on TV, especially if it feels like they're spinning their wheels and they're not really advancing much, uh, eventually the crowd is going to burn out. It feels like there's been some burnout when it comes to Hook. He doesn't have that special aura when he comes out. Plus, he's losing, right? Before, we didn't hear him speak. He was undefeated. Now, we've seen him get pinned. He talks every now and then. It's like, eh, the bloom is off the rose. It's not the same. 
But Moxley and Yuta, they enter through the crowd. They didn't make it very far, though, because Orange Cassidy met Moxley in the crowd. He went after Mox, and Yuta was going at it as well with Hook. Cassidy, you know, I have to say, Orange Cassidy, and I would love to know if it's not him who it would be. Orange Cassidy has to have the record for the greatest number of opening matches in Dynamite history. And whoever number two is has to be a distant number two. I don't even know who it would be. Nobody, there's no way that anybody has started more episodes of Dynamite in the ring than this guy. I don't know why. I don't know what it is. But it's got to be Orange Cassidy. So the announcers noted that the match had not yet officially started because they were brawling all over the crowd. Once they got to the ring, the referee finally called for the bell. Hook got an early German suplex on John Moxley. After that, it was all Blackpool Combat Club while Cassidy was down on the floor. He was selling his arm from the uh, pre-match brawl. Hook went for a red rum. Moxley backed into his own corner and Yuta took Hook to the floor. Cassidy returned and he dove out onto Yuta. Back inside, Hook put Moxley down with a T-bone, and Cassidy tagged in. He jumped off the ropes. He caught Moxley with a DDT on the way down. Moxley came right back. He held Cassidy up while Yuta hit him with a heart attack clothesline. Yuta tagged in, and Cassidy got isolated. That took us into the first picture-in-picture -picture break of the night. Hook and Yuta, they tagged in. They were trading strikes. Cassidy tackled Moxley and took him down to the ringside area. Moxley ran Cassidy into the barricade. Hook gives Yuta a suplex. Now he's setting up for Red Rum. Moxley, though, returns to the ring, and he drops Hook with a cutter. Cassidy blasted Moxley with an orange punch, and this was the key spot in the match. The orange punch is his finisher, or one of his finishing maneuvers. He blasted Moxley with it, and all Moxley did, it just made him angrier. He shook it off. He no-sold it. And then he knocked Cassidy out of the ring. Hook went for red rum on Moxley. Yuta, though, hit Hook on the apron. He was on the apron, hit him in the back of the head. And Moxley hit a death rider on Hook. Yuta tagged in. He rolled Hook into the seatbelt. Pinning combination. And he got the one, two, three. So Hook takes the loss for his team. After the match, Moxley took the microphone. Cassidy was sitting at ringside up against the barricade. He's nursing his arm. He looked dejected. And Moxley is looking down at him, and he says, Cassidy is nothing. He has never been anything. He said it was time for a course correction. He said he would grind Cassidy to dust, and he would walk out of full gear as the new international champion, and there was nothing that Cassidy could do to stop him. So this was the other key match on the show on Saturday uh, that they did something on the show as far as trying to uh, advance that story. And they really made a big deal on commentary about the fact that Moxley it had no effect. The Orange Punch, one of Cassidy's signature maneuvers, had no effect on him. And it might have just killed his confidence, the fact that he used it and he couldn't even drop the guy with it. And then you had that Moxley promo at the end. So Ca Cassidy... I had Cassidy winning at full gear anyway. If you listen to my predictions over the weekend, I had Orange Cassidy pegged to win this match on Saturday. Even more so after this segment, he's winning on Saturday. That's still my prediction for full gear. I'm even more confident in that. John Moxley does not need the international title. He didn't need it before, but he doesn't need it now. And everything they did here was designed to make you think that Orange Cassidy, that this guy had his number. He threw his best at John Moxley, and it did not work. And then Moxley put him in his place on the microphone when the match was over. And now the story going into full gear is that Orange Cassidy, he has an uphill battle here. He has an uphill mountain to climb if he wants to beat this man. I think he will. I think it makes more sense for him to win here and then go on to drop the title either to Jay White or to Keshta. Either one of those men coming out of this pay-per-view. and I don't know when they would do it. It could be Winter is Coming. It could be World's End. Whenever Cassidy finally does lose the title again, I think it should be to one of those two. John Moxley does not need the international title. Orange Cassidy is someone who would benefit from the win here, and then you get that title onto a heel and let them have a run with it. I'd like to see Takeshita with it. Bring some gold into the Don Callis. 
But if they wanted to have some gold in Bullet Club gold and have Jay White, because he's not winning on Saturday, I don't think, uh, I'd be okay with that too. So Tony Schiavone was in the ring for our next segment, a face-to-face -face with Hangman Page and Swerve Strickland that he explained to us ahead of their Texas death match on Saturday that if either one of them attacked the other, that person would be suspended through the rest of the year. I guess like uh, Brian Danielson was supposed to be out with the orbital bone fracture for the rest of the year. And now he's back in the next few weeks. He's going to be in this uh, Continental Classic. But that's what Shivani said, that uh, this person would be suspended and the match, more importantly, the match on Saturday would be called off. So there could be no physicality instigated by either one of these men. Swerve was out first with Prince Nana. He was doing the whole swerve dance that he does. So he comes out to the ring, then Hangman, he speed walked to the ring. He looked like a man with a purpose. And he came down to the ring. They went nose to nose. Shivani reminded them about the terms that they agreed to. And he started to ask Swerve, how do you justify breaking into another man's home? He had the microphone taken away. He didn't even have a chance to give an answer when Hangman swiped the microphone away from Tony Shivani. And Hangman said, Swerve is a waste of life. And he is dumber today than he was when he got fired. He got his dumbass fired two years ago. Page said that he could tell by looking at Swerve that he just can't cut it. And he said that's the reason why his fiance left him. And his kids don't want to talk to him. Now, I don't know what that was about. But clearly, getting a little personal here. I assume there's some truth in that. I, I'm not aware of Swerve's personal situation, nor do I care, but I guess they made the storyline personal by having him break into the man's home, and so now Hangman throwing some of that back at Swerve. Apparently his kids won't talk to him. Page said that Swerve is a coward who surrounds himself with yes-men like Brian Cage in the Gates of Agony. Swerve is too stupid also to realize that Prince Nana is just using him. And Paige said that the money that Nana makes off Strickland, he uses to buy weed from high school kids. And after Paige is done kicking Strickland's ass, he is kicking Nana's ass, and he's going to take his weed. Taz got a kick out of that line. I did too. That was, that was the line of the promo right there. See, that's reason enough for him to go in there and want to win the match. He's going to kick this. I mean, that's a pretty cool line for the guy, right? I'm going to go in there, I'm going to kick your ass, and then I'm going to take your weed. Like a bully. Page said that Strickland should never have come to his house. But they don't need cops. Because Hangman will be Swerve's judge, jury, and executioner. And then he dropped the mic and he went to go leave. And then I guess he realized that he wasn't done yet. So he went back and he picked the microphone back up. He said he had one more thing to say. He said the stipulation for their face-to-face -face here tonight, it applied to him and Swerve. It did not apply to Prince Nana. And with that, he decked Nana. He mounted him with punches. Swerve made a move. He, he was going to go and kind of pry him off, but he realized, oh, I can't touch him. No physicality. So he summoned the security geeks from outside the ring, because they were all lined up outside. Uh, he summoned them to come on into the ring, and they did. And at that point, Hangman uh, beat up some of the security guards. He laid one of them out with a buckshot lariat. Strickland and Nana, they left the ring. Swerve from the ramp is looking back at Hangman in the ring, and he has this look on his face like he's about to cry, right? And again, he didn't have a chance to say anything here. I thought maybe they'll come back to him. We'll get a backstage promo later in the show. He never, he never even had a chance to speak. Maybe on Friday, he'll have a chance to speak. So they made it personal. Like I said, Swerve never got a word in here. I stand by what I said last week. I stand by exactly what I said in my review last week, that Swerve should win again on Saturday. He should go in there, and he should prove that Wrestle Dream was not a fluke. Because anybody can win one match. I could win a match, right? If, if my, I'm in the ring with my opponent, and he gets easily distracted, as everybody does in this fucking business... I said it the other night during the Raw review. I said these are not cats with a fucking laser pointer. Everybody gets so easily distracted. Even I could win one match, right? 
He needs to go in there and prove that he can win twice. That would be impressive to go in there against the former AEW world champion and beat him twice. And this time, maybe not cheat to do it. That would be huge for Swerve. Are they going to do that? I don't think so. But I'm still going to go with Swerve as the one who I think should win the match on Saturday. But Hangman was great here. Even though we didn't get to hear from the other guy, I thought Hangman was great. I, I love the fire from him. I love how angry and pissed off he was. Because he should be. This man broke into his home. Right? His, his personal abode. His wife. His son. And he broke into his house. He's lucky he didn't murder him. He should be angry. He should be upset. But there's one thing that I thought was completely silly. You have these two men out here, and Tony Schiavone makes it very clear, right, from the very beginning of this segment, that if these two lay a finger on each other, you're suspended for the rest of the year. Okay, fine. But explain this to me. How is it that you're going to have a stipulation where if the two wrestlers put their hands on each other, they'll be suspended? But it's okay for Hangman Page at the end of this segment to beat the living shit out of your security guards with no punishment. I mean, I know we see it every week, but just logically, how is he allowed to get away with that? But oh, he can't touch Swerve or else he'll be suspended for the rest of the year. <laughs> there's no, I know there's no respect for any, that's why I call them security geeks. Now you know why. I call them security geeks every single week because even the company, the, the company itself does not treat them with any respect, not even a little modicum of respect. Hangman should be suspended for putting his hands on the security guards. But of course, that's not going to happen. We go backstage to Lexi Nair, and uh, she was with Roderick Strong and the Kingdom. He's still in his neck brace. He's still in his wheelchair. Roddy said that he knows who the devil is, and he needs to tell his best friend. He told Matt Taven to call him, and Taven called Adam Cole, and it's, a, it's a miraculous how, as he's dialing, they have him up on the screen. I need to know what app this is. This could be very useful for me. So they get Adam Cole up on screen, and Roddy tells Cole that he was a thousand percent sure that MJF is the devil. And Cole told him, just stop. He said, you know, with all these accusations going around, maybe you're the devil. And Roddy said, no, no, no. He goes, you haven't been around to see the, th the things that I've seen. He says, on his life, he would say that MJF is the devil. And Cole said that, uh, look, I got to get going. And then he disconnected. That was the extent to which we had any sort of real devil talk on this show, right? MJF did mention the devil in the closing uh, promo. Um, and we did at the end of, there was a Wardlow video package later where they showed the devil. It's the same footage of the devil that we've seen before. They just take the same little three seconds of footage and they tack it onto the end of the segment. Uh, but again, this is the sort of thing that we got on the show. If you were wondering, was there any real developments with the devil? The answer is no, there we had Sky Blue against Red Velvet with the winner going on to full gear. There's going to be a TBS Championship triple threat match. Chris Statlander is defending her title against Julia Hart and the winner of this match here between Sky Blue and Red Velvet. And I was shocked. And the reason I was shocked is because we got a women's match on this show this early in hour one. Now, normally they stick it in the middle of hour two. So I saw this and I said, holy shit. Tony Khan's really blowing up the script this week. We've got a women's match here. Second match on the show. What's going on? So Excalibur noted on commentary that Red Velvet has beaten Sky Blue in their previous three meetings together, which basically told you who was winning this match. Chris Statlander was shown in the back watching at a very awkward angle so that she could show her title on her shoulder. There was a sequence where these two went back and forth uh, with pin attempts, these rolling pin attempts. They must have had, I mean, there were at least half a dozen of them until finally uh, Red Velvet got a two count. All the other ones got a one count. They stood up. They had the same idea. They went for simultaneous kicks. They knocked each other out. Short time later, Velvet avoided a code blue, but Sky Blue hit Skyfall. 
for a near fall. Velvet came back with the power bomb for a near fall of her own. Sky Blue hit Velvet with a super kick and then ran into a super kick. Blue caught Velvet going for another kick. She caught her leg and she tagged her with a knee strike. Things were going well. I thought they were going well. It was a solid match here until the finish. And you know, they say it's about how you start and how you end. It's about the open, it's about the close. Well, unfortunately, they didn't stick the landing here. Sky Blue went for her Code Blue finish and it got botched. And I don't even know who gets most of the blame for this. If it's Sky Blue, if it's Red Velvet for not going over. It looked like Sky Blue just didn't, you know, when she did her little twist to, to kind of take her down for the Code Blue, maybe she didn't get in the right position. Whoever's fault it was, uh, it didn't look good. It got botched. Red Velvet got taken down, but there was not a lot of impact there, but that was the finish. So she stayed down and she got pinned. And Sky Blue picked up the win. She gets that third spot on Saturday for the TBS title. That was a very unfortunate time uh, for there to be a botch here in this match for the finish of all things. Uh, because before that, I thought this was solid stuff. I thought they were having a pretty uh, pretty good match. You know, the crowd was quiet for part of this until they got into the final minute or so. And it almost looked like there was something going on in the crowd. As it turned out, there was something going on in the crowd. There was a fan in the crowd. I don't know what happened. Obviously had some sort of a medical episode. EMTs were in the crowd tending to the fan. I don't know what happened. I don't know what their condition is, but... If it seemed like the fans were a little distracted, now you know why. RJ City was backstage with the newest addition to the AEW women's division. We met her for the first time on television last week, Mariah May. You know, Mike, you know, you brought up a good point. Red Velvet and Sky Blue. It was Red versus Blue. It was like Bloods versus Crips. They were in California. That's a dangerous match to do. I didn't realize that. Good point. Anyway, RJ's in the back with Mariah May. And they're outside of a locker room. And there's a sign on the door that says, Not Tony Storm. Because Tony Storm probably doesn't want to be bothered by the peasants. Now, last week on the show, when Mariah made her debut, it was in the back with RJ City. And RJ told her that, you just missed her. She left. But I'll tell you what, next week, I'll introduce you. I'll personally introduce you to Tony Storm. And she geeked out. So that's what they were about to do. She knocked on the door, and Luther answered the door. Then he slammed the door shut. RJ said, let me take care of that. So he knocks on the door. Luther opens the uh, door again. He explained the situation and said, look, Mariah, if we could just get a little bit of time in there with Tony. Just a minute of her time. So Luther let them in. Tony was laying on the couch. He was resting. And Mariah started to fangirl. Tony said that, uh, oh, I'm not doing autographs. And Mariah said, no, 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 I'm, I'm a wrestler. She said that uh, she came from stardom, just like Tony did. And talked about what a big fan she was. Tony says she didn't catch a word of what she just said. And Mariah said, look, if you need anything, just let me know. And she left. Tony Storm then barked at Luther to get Tony Khan to give her a tune-up match on Friday. And also to go get her a loofah. And, you know, I can't ever hear the word loofah. Probably ever again for the rest of my life. And not think of Bill O'Reilly. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what. And I don't hear that word very often. I don't have one of my own, but whenever I hear that word, unfortunately, even after all these years, if you know, you know, I wish I didn't, but that's who I think of. Uh, again, I love what they're doing with these two. This is only week two. This is the first segment that we had with Tony Storm and Mariah May in the same room at the same time, right? I remember the first time that Sami Zayn finally got that first meeting in the Bloodline locker room with Roman Reigns and the gold that came out of that. Now, I'm not expecting them to strike gold like that, but I'm going to enjoy this story. I think this is a great way to introduce Mariah. I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with these two 
And I just think it puts her right away. It puts her in a very good position right out of the gate on these shows. Samoa Joe is out to the ring next for a delicious squash with John Cruz. And Joe lost some weight. Joe actually lost some weight. He was 10 pounds lighter this week. And do you know why he was 10 pounds lighter? Because he no longer has to carry around the Ring of Honor television title over his shoulder. That's no longer his problem. So Cruz tried to throw some low kicks and Joe was, was blocking them. He was checking all of them and then he just flattened him. Cruz went up top. He attempted a crossbody and Joe just very casually sidestepped him. And then he slapped on the coquina clutch, and he got the quick submission. After the match, Joe gets on the microphone, and he says, My name is Samoa Joe, and I come from Southern California. Big pot, because they, they were in California for Dynamite tonight. I think they were in Ontario, California. He says, So MJF, since you're in my hood, once again I extend my offer of friendship. And trust me, Time is limited, Max, because you're going to find out whether you have my friendship or not. That I am Samoa Joe, and I am inevitable. Always love a good Samoa Joe squash. Although we had two squashes on this show. That might have been two too many, but they were short. So you don't have to uh, worry about them taking up too much time. We had a video package recapping the announcement from Collision over the weekend. Tony Khan announcing the first ever Continental Classic. If you missed it, basically AEW is doing their own version of the G1. They're doing a round-robin tournament with 12 men starting in the next few weeks. Actually, I think next week. I thought it was the November 22nd episode, so it might be starting next week on Dynamite. And it's going to go all the way to World's End. On December 30th, we'll have the finals. They have not said what, if anything, the winner is going to get. The winner should get something. I don't mean a, a stupid trophy. The winner should get a shot at the AEW World title. Brian Danielson has already entered. Brian Danielson is coming back earlier than expected from his broken orbital bone. Whether he's fully healed or not, he's coming back. We don't know any of the other 11 men who are in this tournament, but I'm looking forward to finding out who it is. Now, he that in the announcement, he said 12 of the top stars in AEW. Top stars. Now, there have to be some names in there who are not top, top guys, whoever that is. So, you know, you might get somebody in there. I could see them putting somebody in there from uh, the Callis family. It could be like a powerhouse Hobbs, right? Hobbs is not a top guy, but I, I could see a Hobbs being in there. But when they say top guys, you know, you got Danielson, you got to have Omega. Jericho will probably end up in there, Takeshita. But then you look at everybody else on the roster. How do you not put Darby Allen in there? How do you not put Hangman Page in there? Maybe Swerve Strickland ends up in there. There's the potential for some really great matches in this tournament. We could end up with Danielson and Omega, part two. You know, they're running their shows for the first time in Montreal at the beginning of December. So there's going to be some tournament matches in Montreal. Kenny Omega should be in a big match on one of those shows. If they're in the same block, because the way it's going to work is you'll have basically, they're describing it, I think, as leagues. But if it's like the G1, you have an A block and a B block. And everybody in the A block wrestles each other at least, you know, well, not at least, but they wrestle each other once. And everybody in the B block will wrestle each other once. And then you end up with the B, the B winner and the A winner against each other in the finals. It's the same format. So we could get, if they're in the same block, Danielson and Omega. We could get Omega and Malachi Black if Malachi Black is one of the men in there. Before he got hurt, they were teasing something with Danielson and Malachi. That probably would have been a full gear match had he not gotten hurt. Maybe we get it in the tournament. Right? You could do Omega and Takeshita. There's a lot of possibilities here. So I'm looking forward to seeing how it all uh, works out. But we don't yet know what the full field is going to be. Jungle Jack. Jungle Jack is, uh, he, well, he's busy being the devil. He's already, gonna, he's already uh, making MJF's life a living hell. We had the Young Bucks against Penta and Commander. Since Ray Phoenix is still out hurt, I heard uh, Metalik refuse to job to Commander again here in this match. And he wasn't even in the match. He just called Tony Khan and said, I'm not losing to him. And he hung up. 
you want to know all about the Metal League situation, you can find the clip on the channel. It's very interesting. Uh, thinks very highly of himself. So what would you expect to see in a match like this, where you have the Young Bucks and Penta? Look, we've seen the Young Bucks and the Lucha Bros before. So even though Phoenix wasn't in there, you got the same kind of match. You get the insane spots, right? It's total spot fest, a lot of craziness. This match was full of it. Commander hit a step up, twisting Hurricane Rana onto Nick off the ropes, followed by a tight rope walk Hurricane Rana that sent Nick crashing into his brother outside. Penta met the Bucks after that with a dive of his own. Penta then started a super kick party before Commander launched off of his partner for a double spike DDT. Penta dropped Matt Jackson with Made in Japan for two. Was it Taz on commentary who made the point that you have a, uh, a luchador from, you know, from Mexico using a move called Made in Japan? Shouldn't it be Made in Mexico? I mean, it's kind of like the Canadian Destroyer being co-opted by uh, Penta, even, in, I think, in Lucha Underground, right? They called it the uh, Mexican Destroyer. Shouldn't it be Made in Mexico? We'll call it Made in Mexico. Only got it two. Commander wanted his rope walk shooting star, but Matt caught him with a rolling, uh, or a couple of rolling Northern Light suplexes. The Bucks try to melt her driver, but Commander cut things off and Penta hit Fear Factor on Nick on the apron. Commander hit a snap Hurricane Rana pin on Matt, only got two. And so while Matt was in a fireman's carry by Penta, Commander walked the ropes and he sprung off of his back to deliver a destroyer to Nick Jackson. Penta hit a uh, fireman's carry jackhammer for a two count. Matt and Penta, they had a slugfest, then they traded super kicks and pump kicks. Matt held his leg. He was holding his leg, and so referee Rick Knox, right? He's their boy. Every Young Bucks match, there's Rick Knox. So, of course, he goes over to check on, on uh, old Buck over here. But that allowed Nick to hit a pair of low blows. One for Commander. One for Penta, and he got booed. Even though they were in the Bucks' backyard, they were in California. They got heat. They got booed for that. Nick followed with a Judas effect on Commander, sending a message to Chris Jericho for full gear. And the Bucks finished him off with the BTE trigger for the win. Yeah, this was fun for what it was. Commander, I thought, was a, a perfectly capable stand-in for Ray Phoenix. Uh, they wrestle similar crazy styles. Uh, but more importantly than anything we saw in the match, because I'll be honest with you, these types of matches, I'm just sort of numb to it at this point. Like, they're fine, but they just, they follow the same formula, and I'm not really, you know, like, oh my god, what an amazing match. Like, eh, it was fine. But the key here was the low blows by Nick Jackson. So they are moving forward with a young Bucks heel turn here, which I like. It's about that time I think the Bucks need a little something different. They don't have a whole lot going on. So I'm all in favor of a young Bucks heel turn. Very interesting to hear them get booze in California. Backstage, Lexi Nair interviewed the young Bucks when this was over after their big win and asked them why they cheated in their hometown. Matt said sources were telling him that the Bucks no longer give a damn about the rules or what to say or what to do. Kenny Omega showed up and he was very disappointed. Very disappointed at what just happened and took issue with the way that they won their match. Doing it in front of their friends and family here, no less. He asked them if that's who they want to be. And Matt said, look who's talking. You're basically saying... You look at your history and the way that you, you know, when you were the champion and in your past, like, you won matches the same way. But then he said, look, our beef is not with you. We got no beef with you. Our beef is with Jericho. And when we beat you at full gear, you guys are no longer going to be partners, and we can get this whole elite thing up and running again. Chris Jericho showed up, and Jericho told Omega, don't waste your time with these jackasses. We got a match to go out and win. 
Jericho called the Bucks kids as he turned to walk away. And that got under Matt Jackson's skin, so he shoved Jericho from behind. And security got involved to try to separate them. We had the guns with Juice Robinson in their corner against Peter Avalon and Jacoby, Jacoby Watts. I almost said Jacoby and Myers. I think that's a New York joke. If you're not from New York, you probably won't get the reference. But all you New York people, you know Jacoby and Myers, right? You might have even used them as a, uh, as a lawyer in a case, maybe. Used to see their commercials all the time. I'd be watching, actually, the syndicated shows on the weekends. And their commercials would come on for Jacoby and Myers. But this was not Jacoby and Myers. This was Jacoby Watts. So this is our second squash match of the night. This one was even shorter than the Samoa Joe match. The guns hit Watts with the 310 to Yuma and got the pin in less than 30 seconds. There you go. They get shorter and shorter. Yes, Jacoby and Myers uh, either is or was. I don't even know if they're still together, but it's a law firm. So Colton Gunn cut a promo about what they just did to these two men. What do you think we're going to do to MJF, one man, on Saturday at Full Gear? Because they are wrestling them. <laughs> them. It'll end up being MJF at a partner, probably Samoa Joe. But right now it's a handicap match. Right now it's only two on one. But they are wrestling MJF for the Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles on the buy-in. So MJF is once again pulling double duty and wrestling on the pre-show before coming back and wrestling in the main event. We got a Wardlow video package. And in this video package, they showed him in the ring and he was training. He was uh, this poor bastard that he was in the ring with. He was power bombing this guy. And he said that he saw fear in the devil's eyes. He said that he would make the devil his bitch. And at the very end of the promo, they cut to that shot of the devil, the, you know, the guy in the devil mask, cocking his head, looking into the camera, and then they cut away. What I do think is that Wardlow is not the devil, but I do think that when it comes time for the big reveal, he'll be one of the henchmen. I'm pretty sure he was one of the guys last week. He might have been the guy who threw Anthony Bowens through the glass. And from what I understand, uh, I think Fightful said that the plan is that all of the, the men in black, the ninjas, whoever is under the masks playing the masked men, that will be who the people actually end up being. Whereas whoever's under the devil mask, whoever's under the devil mask right now, it's irrelevant because it's probably going to end up being a different person anyway. But it looked to me like Wardlow was one of those people last week. So I do think he'll end up being one of the henchmen. And then it was time. Salino and Barnes. I see the Salino and Barnes mentioned here. Salino and Barnes was another law firm, but uh, which one died? One of them died. So now I think it's just Salino, right? Was it Barnes? Did Barnes die? I know, this is riveting, I know. Now we can start getting into all these old New York commercials I used to see. Dr. Zismore. Everybody in New York knew who Dr. Zismore, Dr. Jonathan Zismore, is a dermatologist, and he took out a whole bunch of advertising, and he was just a bunch of patients going, thank you, Dr. Zismore. I looked like shit before, but now I look good. Thank you, Dr. Zismore. It was time for the Sega-sponsored match. Up next, the Like a Dragon Gaiden Street Fight. With the Don Callis family, Brian Cage on loan from the Mogul Embassy. No, he is not a part of the Callis family, but Sammy Guevara is still out. I don't know if he's still concussed, uh, but... Ty Conti or Ty Mello is, uh, I don't think she's given, has she given birth already? I don't think so. I think she's about to pop, but I don't think she has yet. So anyway, he's, uh, he's not back. So they had Brian Cage on loan from the Mogul Embassy. Funny enough, Brian Cage just had baby number three yesterday. A bouncing baby boy. He and Melissa Santos of uh, Lucha Underground fame. 
I don't know how many kids they've had together or if he had kids prior to them getting married, but I, I know this was baby number three for him. Uh, I think the boy's name is Logan. So you just had a kid yesterday, tweeted the photo from the hospital with the little one, and here he was, though, I gotta get to work. I got a street fight that I gotta be a part of here. It was him, Powerhouse Hobbs, Kyle Fletcher, and Konosuke Takeshita against Chris Jericho, Kenny Omega, Kota Ibushi, and Paul White. Yes, Paul White. Now, they had signs all around ringside that were made out to look like giant, like, Japanese takeout menus. I guess that's from the game, I guess. I don't know, but they had those signs all over the ringside area. Jericho came out dressed like a hitman, codename 47. He had his black suit, his black tie, his white dress shirt. He had the uh, the baseball bat. Floyd was with him as well. I guess he was supposed to look like a member of the Yakuza. Chris Jericho and the Yakuza, not two things I normally would put together. See, Jericho strikes me as the kind of person who would go out partying in uh, Rapungi or something, and he would be hitting on the wrong woman, and the Yakuza would put a hit out on him. They would take him out back and just fucking bury him in the back or something. But he was out there dressed like a member of the Yakuza. Omega and Ibushi, they came out, they joined him on stage, and then, well, here comes Paul White. Paul White walks out, and he too is in a full suit and tie. And this was his first televised, I think he's had a couple of dark matches over the past year. But this was his first televised match, I believe, since March of last year. And they had this fucking guy out there in a suit and tie, wrestling in a suit. <laughs> Which I'm sure would not be comfortable even for the average person, let alone somebody of his size. So the heels came to meet them on the ramp to get this party started. And <laughs> Paul White stayed right where he was. He was like, come on, he wasn't moving. So they came to him. And Hobbs came after him. Then Kyle O'Reilly, or Kyle Fletcher, not spoiling anything here, Kyle Fletcher, not Kyle O'Reilly, Kyle Fletcher came after him, and then he grabs Kyle by the throat, and he delivers a chokeslam to Kyle Fletcher, chokeslams him off the stage, down through a table below. So that takes care of him for the time being. And then Paul White and Powerhouse Hobbs make their way to the back. That was the last that we saw of Paul White in the actual arena for the rest of this match. They, uh, the next time we saw him, he was working over Powerhouse Hobbs out in the parking lot. Omega tried to use a barbed wire bat, and it looked to me like he actually had it, and he was kind of grating it over Takeshita's forehead, but I guess maybe the idea was that Takeshita was stopping him because, I mean, it's not like Takeshita came up bleeding or anything. So I guess he fought him off. He ran Jericho into, or uh, Omega rather, into one of the giant menu signs by the ring post. Kota Ibushi. Let's just skip to the good part here, or the bad part, I guess, depending on how you look at it. But this was, this was Ibushi in, in DDT is what this was. Ibushi is on stage, and he's on a bicycle. And I'm assuming, again, this is something from the game, maybe where you ride a bicycle. I haven't played the game, so I don't know. He's on a bicycle. He's got a pipe in one of his hands. And he begins to slowly ride the bike down the ramp. And as he is riding the bike down the ramp, with the pipe in his hand, he is delivering these shots with the pipe that the heels had to sell. And these were the weakest shots that you have ever seen. It somehow made the chair shot that Hulk Hogan gave to Conan in WCW look brutal. This made the Lance Storm chair shot in ECW to Rob Van Dam look brutal. Just to give you a sense. And they had a sell for it. So first, he gives Kyle Fletcher a little tap with the pipe. Then he gives Takeshita, as he continues to ride, he gives Takeshita a little tap with the pipe. And then, as he is rounding the bed, He's at ringside, he's about to round one of the ring posts, and Brian Cage is there waiting for him. And Brian Cage says, 
No fucking way am I selling for this shit. And he clotheslines Ibushi off the bicycle, folds him up, lands right on his neck, and he just clotheslines him right off the bike. See, that made it all worth it. That right there, if it isn't already, that is going to be a meme by the morning. I can picture it now. By the morning, it'll be a meme. It'll be Ibushi riding down the ramp, giving Fletcher a little love tap. It'll say Saturday. He'll continue riding, little tap to Takeshita. It'll say Sunday. And then as he rounds the ring post and Brian Cage clotheslines the shit out of him, there's Monday. That's how Monday feels. I could just see it. I could picture the meme in my head. So yes, when he clotheslined him, he took a brutal, he took a hard fall, but I cackled. I, I did get a kick out of that. So outside the building, we see Powerhouse Hobbs, and he is standing on top of a bunch of uh, wooden pallets. And he's got Paul White, and he picks him up for a body slam. And he didn't really get a great grip on him because Paul White's a big guy. So he really kind of struggled with him a little bit, but he picked him up for a body slam, and he body slams the giant on the hood of this car. And it looked like he shattered part of the windshield as well. But this guy took a bump, a body slam on the hood of a car, and then rolled off and landed on the floor. And that shocked the hell out of me, because I've, as I've said before, he's had numerous hip surgeries. That's why he hasn't been wrestling. But when he came out on television a couple of weeks ago, he did not look good. Or maybe it was last week. He did not look good. He came out. He stood there. He looked barely mobile. And it was like, how is this guy going to go into a match? Now, it's an eight-man tag, so it's not like it's a singles match. But still, like this guy looked like he can barely move. He had two giant heavy braces or a brace on one leg, a sleeve on the other. And here he is taking a body slam on top of a car. So that was a bigger bump than I expected him to take in this match. I hope he's okay. Because I'm sure that couldn't have felt too good. But uh, yeah, I was not expecting him to take that kind of a bump here. And so that spelled the end of the night for him. That was it. We didn't see the big show again for the... That might have been. You know what? Yes. Daddy Ugarte. That might have been the big show's last bump on his bump card. But I don't think he's got very many of them left. In the ring, Takeshita was battering Omega and Jericho and Ibushi with the bicycle. And I'm pretty sure this is the first time that I can recall somebody using a bicycle to bludgeon somebody on a wrestling show. I can't remember another spot like that. Back outside, we saw the referee was checking on Paul White. He had not moved. He was still laid out unconscious on the ground. He was calling for help. Back in the ring, Takeshita then dropped Ibushi with a brain buster on top of the bike. And that took us into a picture-in-picture -picture break. Takeshita and Jericho, they were brawling backstage. They were on the concourse somewhere coming out of the uh, commercial break. In the arena, Brian Cage set up a couple of tables at ringside. In the ring, Cage and Fletcher, they double suplexed Omega onto, uh, it was like a blue pallet of some kind. I don't know what the hell it was. Again, maybe it was something from the game. I don't know. Fletcher then wanted to smash a glass bottle over Omega's head. Uh, Omega, though, fought free from Cage. He blocked it. Omega then took the bottle, and he smashed the bottle over Fletcher's head instead. And in doing so, it looked like he may have cut his own hand. I know he cut Fletcher open, <clears throat> or at least that was the idea. I mean, when they came back to Fletcher a few moments later, he was bleeding. Maybe, yeah, he probably cut himself. But uh, it looked like maybe Omega may have uh, cut his hand. Real glass, cry me a river. I'm sure it wasn't real glass, because that would be incredibly stupid if it was. Takeshita was shown talking shit into the camera. Now we're back on the concourse. He's talking shit into the camera about Jericho. Jericho is down. Takeshita then climbs on top of, it was like, a, I guess, a soft drink refrigerator that they have there in the, uh, the merch area, the concession area. Climbs on top of this giant refrigerator. And he comes diving off. But as he's diving off, Jericho sprays him in the face with a fire extinguisher. Back to the ring. Omega. This was like anarchy in the arena, basically. Only they called it the, uh, you know, like a... What the fuck is the name of this game? <laughs> I should 
should have written this down. The uh, the like a boss game, whatever it is. And uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the name of this game. So anyway, this is basically like anarchy in the arena. If uh, if you want to simplify it, that's basically what they did here. This is gonna annoy me. So in the ring, Omega and Ibushi, they're setting up for a double team move on Brian Cage. They gave it up though when they saw Cage, uh, or rather uh, Hobbs. I guess he had ditched the giant. Now Hobbs is coming back down to the ring. He gets in the ring. He wipes them out with a double clothesline. Like a dragon, thank you. You know what I was thinking of? Double dragon. That's what I was thinking of. Because I a double dragon was also Sega, I think, right? Double dragon. I mean, I remember that. They don't do those anymore, right? They don't do double dragon anymore. Now we're going back. Now we're going back. Double Dragon, Contra. Used to play all those games. Master Blaster. They showed Kyle Fletcher down at ringside. He was bleeding from the forehead. Cage then suplexed Omega from the apron out of the ring. All the way down onto those tables that he had set up outside the ring. And he went with them. So they both crashed through the table down below. Omega came up holding his head. Hobbs nailed the spine buster in the ring to Ibushi. And that took us into another picture-in-picture -picture break. Okay, so Double Dragon was on the NES. All right, I thought it was Sega. Yeah, you're right. It was, it was NES. Yeah, you're right. Kung Fu. Yes, Kung Fu was another one that I played. Never played Streets of Rage. Never played that one. Out of the break, Jericho hit a code breaker on Hobbs. Cage hoisted Jericho up and gave him an F5. Fletcher hit Omega with a Snapdragon. There were some chairs outside the ring with one of the video game signs laid across it. And Fletcher, on the apron, picks up Ibushi in a tombstone pile driver position. And he proceeds to leap off the apron and he delivers a tombstone pile driver onto the chairs through the sign. Tombstone pile driver to the floor. Okay. That got holy shit chance from the crowd. You would think, boy, that spells the end of Kota Ibushi, right? We saw the, the big show get body slammed on a car in the parking lot. He's done for. Now Ibushi gets tombstoned on top of all this debris on the floor. He's done for. Fuck you. You're wrong. Not the last time that we would see Kota Ibushi. Omega and Jericho, they double teamed Hobbs in the ring. And they decide that we're going to use duct tape. I'm going to tape this guy to the top rope. He, he has to be restrained. So they tape him to the top rope. And Hobbs is yelling at Jericho. So then they duct tape his mouth shut. And they slammed, I think it was Omega, slammed one of the signs over Hobbs' head. Brian Cage returned. He put Omega down with a clothesline. Somehow, Kota, now a lot of time has not exactly passed by. I don't know how many minutes it was. It might not have even been minutes. Kota Ibushi is outside the ring and he's putting chairs in the ring for his partner. Ibushi is back up like nothing happened. The guy got tombstoned to the floor. It was a transition spot. So he's outside the ring. He's putting chairs in the ring. Cage hits a pump handle slam on Jericho. And then he sets up for drill claw to Omega, but Omega slips out. Jericho hits Cage with his baseball bat from the floor. He hits him with a baseball bat shot. Omega follows with a poison Rana. Hit Cage with a V trigger. In the end, he gets Cage up on his shoulders, and he hits Brian Cage with the one-winged angel, and he pinned him to win the match. Ibushi getting up that quickly from a tombstone is ridiculous. But honestly, is it really any more ridiculous than the sight of him riding a bicycle to the ring and giving love taps with a pipe to different people and them having to sell it? I mean, basically, is it any more ridiculous than him playing Paperboy? Another game, by the way. That was always a favorite of mine, Paperboy. 
That's what he was. He was paper boy, only instead of the paper, he was delivering a pipe. He was laying down pipe in this match. That's the only difference. So was that really any more or less ridiculous than him no-selling a tombstone to the floor? Probably not. Still fucking stupid. But this match was just, it was pure silliness and craziness and insanity. And as I said at the beginning, I was never bored. I thought it was entertaining enough. So I can't complain about that. That I can't complain about. It kept my interest. It was a wild brawl. And again, there were some insane bumps in this match. The brain buster on the bike. The Brian Cage suplex to Omega from the ring over and out through two tables on the floor. I mentioned the tombstone spot already, so there were some pretty crazy spots in this match. The good thing is they kept the Big Show's role to a minimum here because he clearly can't do much. He clearly can't do much. And the one big spot they used him for was a power spot to try to put Powerhouse Hobbs over. So I would rather see Powerhouse Hobbs do what he did here to Paul White then get Paul White in the ring and have to actually wrestle a match just so Hobbs can pin him, right? Because he clearly should not be in the ring. But him picking up the big show and body slamming him on top of a car is a lot more memorable than him giving him a spine buster and pinning him in the middle of the ring. So at least they tried to use him in a way that elevated the younger star, right? They, they tried. He still had no business being in this match. I know he, wants, he wanted this. He wanted to wrestle again. He's worked very hard to come back from the surgeries. I've heard him talk and do interviews, so I know it's something that he wanted. And look, th this was an eight-man tag. You can hide him. He doesn't have to do much. But honestly, I don't need to see it again. At least they used him in a way that made sense. And keep in mind here that the one member of the heel team that lost is not an official member of the Callus family. So they could still come back, and they should still come back, to Omega and Takeshita. This issue with Omega and Callus is not over. His team technically did not lose. It was a, a person filling in for a member of the Callus family who lost the match for the Callus family. We still have to get that rematch with Omega and Takeshita. And maybe we'll get it as part of the Continental Classic if they end up in the same group. And if they don't, maybe they end up in different groups, but they make it all the way to the finals. And there's your finals at World's End. Maybe it's Omega vs. Takeshita Part 2. MJF was out to the ring next. He was going to send us home with a promo. He was looking very solemn. And he was apologetic to the acclaimed for what happened. He felt bad about what happened to them last week. He felt responsible like it was his fault, which it was. And by the way, uh, the goal tonight, I don't think I mentioned the goal tonight for Be The Booker is 400 likes. We're not there yet. So hit that thumbs up. Get us up. Get us up to 400 because we're, uh, we're, coming, we're coming to the end soon. So go ahead and like the video. So he was very apologetic about what happened last week. And he hopes they get better. All he's ever wanted to be is a world champion. He says he spent his entire life trying to make that a reality. And he is proud to say that he has made it to the mountaintop of pro wrestling. But it's not all glitz and glam. The air up there is thin. Tell that to Darby Allen because he wants to make it to the top of Mount Everest in a few months. And has said that the people he's training with have told him that nobody that they know has ever taken six months to train for a Mount Everest climb. The people that do it, it takes years. Like, they're amazed that Darby is actually doing this. This guy has a death wish. He really does. So he should give Darby some tips about what it's like to be on top of this mountain. He says the air is thin, it's daunting, it's lonely. And as he looks in every single direction, he sees men trying to shove him off the top. And he's man enough to admit that he is afraid. He's afraid that he could lose it all in the blink of an eye. And he's afraid that he's going to do all of us, do to all of us, what he did to Adam Cole and what he did to the acclaimed. He's afraid that he's going to let us all down. Oh. He said the old me would have tucked his tail and ran, but he's done letting his past dictate his present and his future. He goes, yeah, he may be afraid, but you better send a whole damn army to get 
him to come down from that mountain. Jay White, you've been walking around with a title that you have not earned. At full gear, I'm going to have, or he's going to have, a shot to take it away from him, but he doesn't think he can. He doesn't think anybody can. And he says a message to the man who stole his devil mask and hired those goons. He says he is going to find out who they are, and when he does, there will be hell to pay. Bullet Club Gold's music hit. Jay White walked out alone. He had the big Burberry belt over his shoulder. He said MJF isn't fooling him with all of his distractions. He's told us before that he is the devil, right? He says it every week when he comes out. He said MJF is not the hero here. He's not the fan scumbag. He means nothing to them, and they mean nothing to him. He said MJF hasn't changed, and he knows that Jay White knows that his days are numbered as the AEW World Champion. And he knows that at full gear, he'll breathe with the switchblade. And if he's not down with that, he's got two words for him. Get him. And so the other members of Bullet Club Gold come up from behind MJF in the ring to attack. Juice Robinson gives him the left hand of God. The guns drop him with the 310 to Yuma. Jay White comes to the ring. He hits Blade Runner. He covers MJF. Juice Robinson makes the three count. And they all celebrate together. Cut to a shot of Samoa Joe watching in the back, and he looks like he's fuming by what he's seeing. Because MJF still hasn't taken him up on his offer yet. So we have a shot of Joe looking at what's going on in the ring with MJF down. And the announcer said that MJF may want to take him up on his offer. And that is how they went off the air. So the key angles going into Saturday, it's MJF and Jay White. I'm actually glad they closed the show with it because I feel like they don't close with the champion enough on these shows. So when we went off the air on Dynamite, the focus was on the main event, as it should be. The focus was on the main event on Saturday. The only criticism I have is they've really, I think, gone the extra mile to make you believe that Jay White is going to win. Jay White has pinned MJF on television. Jay White has basically been the AEW world champion for a month. He stole the fucking belt. He's had it with him this entire time. Right? And so they basically told you here, going off the air with him laying out MJF and getting a visual pin on him, second pin, that he's not winning on Saturday. Doing everything they've done, they're trying to give him credibility going into the main event at full gear. But all they've done, I feel like, is make it even more obvious that he's not going to win. But I, I get why they did what they did. So they kept the focus on that here at the end uh, of the show. Hangman, again, I talked about that. I thought very, very good promo from Hangman Page. Surprise, we got no rebuttal from Swerve. That might be coming on Friday. That's one of the matches I'm looking forward to the most on Saturday. Um, but for a lot of the other matches on the card, we didn't really get much in the way of, of build. Uh, no Sheeta on the show. The Tony Storm segment was completely independent of anything involving Hikaru Shida. It was more focused on her and Mariah May. Nothing with Sting and Darby and Christian and them. Uh, nothing on the tag team titles. We had uh, a little bit of progression, obviously, on the TBS title stuff. Now we know who the third person is going to be. Uh, I think it's very possible Julia Hart will win the championship on Saturday. I'm still predicting a Chris Statlander win, but... The way that Julia Hart has been pushed of late, and she's actually had some pretty impressive uh, performances, I think, on television, wouldn't surprise me if she walks out with that tie. It would surprise me if Sky Blue won. I'm not expecting that at all. Um, so again, I, I felt like they did what they had to with the key stuff, but they neglected some other things on this show. They have three hours coming up on Friday, so there's going to be a lot more, I'm sure, that takes place on, on Collision and Rampage on Friday. So overall, it was solid. I do not agree with these. I don't know where some of these comments are coming from, that it was a return to form for AEW. I didn't get that at all. Uh, so yeah, I think that's that's uh, overblowing it. It was solid, but unspectacular. And as far as the street fight is concerned, it's not going to be everybody's cup of tea. It was madness. It was it was silliness. There were parts of it I, I got a nice laugh out of. And then there was... The no selling and stuff, it's just, it's one of my biggest pet peeves, honestly. 
and you could probably say that about wrestling in general, but especially in AEW, is doing big spots like that and then like popping right up from it. And it's just on to the next. What does it all mean? When you do that, what does it mean? The next time we see a big destroyer, the next time Commander comes off the top rope and does some fucking 720 split, who gives a shit? What does it mean? Who cares? At that point, it, it literally is just gymnastics. That's all it is. Because it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't take anybody out. Right? It's just a setup to whatever comes next. And what I get a tickle out of in a lot of these situations is you'll see a match like that, and they'll do some big spectacular spot. Right? A big dive or a big pile driver. Something that should finish the guy off. And then they'll kick out. Right? We'll get the near fall. And then the match will end with a fucking roll-up. Like, stuff like that just annoys the shit out of me. And I feel like we see, we see that way more often than we should. Uh, but that maybe that's me. Maybe that's just me. Maybe, maybe it has passed me by. I don't know. But I don't think that's a good thing. Anyway, let's take a look at the uh, Twitter poll here. What did you think of Dynamite for November 15th? Am I making sense? Am I crazy or am I just making sense? I think I'm making sense, aren't I? 68.5% thumbs up for Dynamite, 31.5% thumbs down for tonight's show. Yeah, the distraction, well, don't get me started on the distraction roll-ups. That, that's a whole other rant. We've been there before with those. Let me take a look here and see. I don't know if, um, no, they're not showing up. See, Super Chat, uh, I think because you know what happened? They updated OBS and I haven't updated because I don't want to because every time I update anything, it breaks. I'm still using iOS 15. I think they're up to 17 by now. I haven't updated because Every time I update, I get fucked. My whole thing is, if it works, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Every time I try to update to the latest and greatest, I get screwed, something doesn't work, I lose stuff. So anyway, I'll get that fixed, but it's not showing up. I'm going to read them uh, I'm gonna read them from here. I got all your super chats right here. I'm going to go through them right now. By the way, we are at 421 likes. So we have already hit the goal for Be The Booker. So let's uh, let's see if we can get that closer to 500. That would be very cool. But we will be doing Be The Booker here in a little bit. Oh, man. <laughs> Same. Yeah, well, it's funny. I'll tell you something else. One of the reasons I don't want to update my iOS, not the only reason, but one of the reasons I'm trying to avoid updating, I think, I feel like I may be one of the few who still has the Twitter app on, on their phone with the old blue Twitter bird icon. It says Twitter. It doesn't say X. I refuse to update. Every time it pushes out app updates, I'll update every other app except that one. So I still have the blue bird. I'm going to hold on to the blue bird as long as I can. I'm sure at some point I'm going to accidentally update. I'm going to be forced to update. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm holding on to that as long as I can. So we'll see how long that goes before they get me. We'll see. All right, let's go to your uh, super chats here. Let's go. Oh, we got a bunch of them here. All right, well, we got Wild Bird kicking us off. Says, I'm sorry, but Tony Khan has a punchable face. According to, according to Wild Bird, Tony Khan has a punchable face. Uh, Brother Fluff Salisbury with the $5 Super Chat. Big Show has pretty much the most face heel turns for men's wrestlers. Who would have the most for the women? Is it Natalia? Yeah, you know, that's the other thing. We didn't see uh, Paul White turn heel tonight. He actually stayed babyface. Very impressed. I'm very proud of him. I thought we were going to get another turn tonight. 
Uh, let's see. For the women? Yeah, I guess it would be Natalia, right? Who else would it be? She's been around forever. It probably would be Natalia. Wild Bird with a pair of Super Chats. When I saw the video clip on Draymond Green giving Rudy Gobert a chokehold, I thought about the CM Punk and Jack Perry scuffle. And Draymond Green is turning into the NBA's version of CM Punk, outspoken and a cult of personality. Chris Miner with the $5 super chat. The full gear signing must be you, Solo Monster. Tony Khan must have been really impressed with your Punjabi prison match against the great Kali. Well, I guess the cat's out of the bag, right? Cat's out of the bag. Tony Khan's going to bring me in to help him out here with some uh, some of the booking behind the scenes in AEW. I mean, Lord knows he can use the help. Guy's got a lot on his plate. But uh, no, the signing is not. I'm too expensive. You can't afford it. Samoan fan. Clearly the devil has to be Jim Cornette. Some people would say that he is. Sid Fishy with the five bucks. When the devil first appeared, Excalibur said he or she. Now they only say he, making us think it's not a female. I still think it's Maria Kanellis. Mm, I think that would be lame. Bobbert Reviews with that $32 super chat. Hopefully Sega will use AEW to promote the next Sonic game. Maybe even make Sonic all elite. Oh, man. Well, they'll have to take the uh, people like the Bucks and Commander and Penta and, and put them in that match. Because Sonic is very fast, right? Sonic, he moves around very quickly. So if we get another sponsored match, you'll have to... Take one of these spot vests and just have them doing all kinds of crazy stuff and you'll have gold coins, right? The, the giant gold coin, the brass ring hanging from the ceiling. <clears throat> what about Knuckles? Does Knuckles get in there? Uh, Libido Bell. Taker. What? What does it say? Taker, Tombstone, OnlyFans, filling holes and showing souls. Oh my god. What have I started? We talked about Undertaker having an OnlyFans the other night. Not that he does. I mean, I hope not, but... People have, people have run with this. Filling holes and showing souls. S-O-L-E-S. Eric the Sean with the $10 super chat. Eric, thank you. Bullet Club Gold needs some more star power for me to take them seriously. Maybe even add Wardlow as their silent enforcer. I think Wardlow is going to be occupied with whoever this devil is. He may be part of a different faction, so... That may not be possible. They may have something else in mind for him. No, no. Uh, no. Boomerang Undertaker does not have an OnlyFans. He has a Patreon. He has a podcast on Patreon, but he does not have an OnlyFans. Not yet. Please do not put that out into the atmosphere. We don't need that. Jaden Burks with the $4.99. Buy, sell, or rent on Darby against Vader. Darby against Mike Awesome. And Darby against Sheamus. Also, much love solo, a sane voice in a wild wrestling world. Somebody has to bring some sanity to the space. In in a in a space filled with a, just a bunch of crazy people. Sometimes you just need some common sense and a calm voice. That's what I bring to the table. Until something pisses me off. Then we go off the rails. Buy, sell, or rent? You know what? Darby and Sheamus is interesting, because Sheamus would just... My God, Sheamus would abuse this poor guy. I would go... You know, I... In a sadistic kind of way, Darby against Vader intrigues me. Uh, I think I'm gonna buy, though. 
you know what I am going to buy? I'm going to buy on Darby and Vader. I'm going to rent on Darby and Sheamus, and I'm going to sell on Darby and Mike Awesome. Paul Carpenter with the $5 Super Chat. Billy Corgan said it's real Coke. Cry me a river. A bicycle. Really? They make it too easy to make fun of the show. Uh, Swerve is the best thing on Dynamite. Well, Swerve is definitely one of the best parts of the show. Wild Bird. If Mercedes Monet signs with AEW, the women's division better get more television time to compete with WWE and Impact. I know Mercedes is watching the AEW women. Well, she was at Wembley Stadium. They had her in the crowd at All In. Acknowledged her on TV. Jazz Jackrabbit, your Perfect Strangers reference made me smile. I love Balky. He and Larry should have been bigger. FYI, making 138,000 accounts to see the dance of joy. Balky Bartakamus from Mipos. One of the great television sitcom characters. Of course, from Perfect Strangers, we got a great spinoff in Family Matters. Because the mother from Family Matters worked at the newspaper that Larry and Balky worked at. Harriet. Harriet was her name. Wild Bird, I doubt it, but what if Will Ospreay is the devil? Possible, but yeah, I don't I don't see it. Barry MK400, I just saw that picture of Rey Mysterio. You know the... Oh, yeah, I saw that picture of Rey Mysterio. Unfortunately. Apparently, that was from some... I guess the ESPN body issue. I don't know how far back that image goes, but I guess they must have had him in the ESPN body issue, and somebody on Twitter was circulating a photo of Rey Mysterio. He posed for a picture naked. So, yeah, it's not like you see the twig and dingleberries or anything like that, but he's sitting there naked. So, somehow this ended up on my timeline. And, uh, yeah, that, that was not what I was uh, expecting today. And HBKC83. Is that it? I think, I think that's it. All right, HBKC83, you get the last word. I would like to formally announce that I, too, am asking for my release from MLW. Well, damn it, you know... First me, now you. Everybody is asking for their release from MLW. I don't know what's going on over there. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> well, thank you guys. I think uh, that about wraps up the Super Chats. Man, we got Rey Mysterio doing the body issue of, of ESPN Magazine. We got people talking about Undertaker on OnlyFans. The sick fucking world we live in, let me tell you. This is a sick, sick world. All right, well, that's it on the Super Chat, I think. Let's see. Oh, you know what? No, I got I to gotta reload. You're right. There's more. <laughs> There's a few more. There's a few more Super Chats. See, I hate reading it. I have to read it this way. When the other screen isn't working and I have to read it directly out of the YouTube dashboard, it doesn't, like, update automatically. I have to re refresh the page, and then they pop up. It's very annoying. But we'll get that fixed after. Uh, Jazz Jackrabbit says, Missed Raw and the Resurrection of Jackie Robinson. Yeah, this is becoming a weekly occurrence now where they have Jackie Redman because they've, they've changed the backstage interview. They changed months ago. And so now Jackie Redmond is the backstage interviewer on Monday Night Raw. And I guess last week I accidentally referred to her as, uh, what did I call her? Um, Jackie, um, <laughs> I, call, I called her something else last week. This week I called her Jackie Robinson by accident, Jackie Robinson. Somebody asked me, they said, are you going to call her Jackie Chan next week? I said, I hope not. I don't know why I can't get this woman's name right. We'll see. Uh, Will Chisholm. I know Mercedes. 
I know it's Mercedes, but my petty side wants it to be Ronda Rousey. Just for the reactions. Well, no, Tony Khan said that it, all AEW fans have respect for this person, so. It's definitely not Ronda Rousey. Arabian Night 2000, what if the devil is Thunder Rosa leading a men's group? Yes, but why would Thunder Rosa be stalking MJF? And what's the payoff? Again, I asked the, I asked the same question about the Britt Baker possibility. What is the payoff? I don't see it. Jackie Gleason. That's right, yeah. I called her Jackie Gleason last week. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> the Honeymooners is before my time. So I don't know where Jackie Gleason came from. Jackie Gleason, Jackie Robinson, Jackie Chan, Jackie Onassis. I don't know. Jackie Brown, great movie. Uh, J. Ray with the $5. Works exist. Uh, so let's not hold on to the narrative of everything having to make logical business sense and wrestling anything can happen and has. Yes, and that does not make it good. It can be very fucking bad. That's the point. Of course, wrestling is a work. You can mold it and shape it and do whatever you want with it. It's a very unique business. There's no other industry like it. The wrestling business should not exist. If you think about how crazy the wrestling business is, it should not exist, but it does. And it's full of crazy people, and it's full of crazy things, and not everything is always going to make sense. But there are also times where you insult the intelligence of the viewer when you just ignore certain things and things don't make sense in certain situations when they should. And I think it's very disrespectful to the audience. That does happen, too. It's happened a lot over the years on WWE television. Fucking lazy. And then there are other times where not everything has to make sense, and it can just be fun and silly, right? That's also part of the wrestling business. So I agree with you on that. Bass Beerus says Dan Smith will teach you guitar. Who's Dan Smith? And Tessa Blanchard is the devil in AEW. Not in AEW, she's not. Elsewhere, some people might say that, but not in AEW. All right, now I think we're caught up, right? Face Beerus, that was the last one. All right, so now we're caught up. That's it. That's uh, that's all the Super Chats. That's all you guys got. We were at 438 likes, which is uh, very kind of you. I thank you for that. Naked Midian was fun. Teach thorough. No comment on that. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to be the Booker. Wasn't expecting that comment tonight. Naked Midian was fun. Says Turtlehead. It is time to be the booker, and we're going to do things a little bit differently here. It was pointed out to me, and I think it's a valid observation, that we should do be the booker in reverse. We should save the men's match as the main event. So we are going to kick things off here with the tag teams, and we're going to work our way to the women, and then we're going to have our main event one-on-one -on -one in the men's division. How does that sound? I think that actually makes more sense. So I think we may do it this way from now on. So let's kick things off with a tag team match, right? I'm a fan of tag team wrestling. Matter of fact, I'm a fan of these two men right here, Chad Gable and Otis, the Alpha Academy, the former Raw Tag Team Champions. Kicking things off here and be the book. And we have the Alpha Academy taking on 
Andre the Giant and Haku, the Colossal Connection. All due respect to Haku. Andre could barely move during this period. Now, if this was prime Andre the Giant, now we're talking a different story here. But seeing Andre in this condition, by 1990, I mean, seeing him in this condition, there just wasn't much he could do. It's like a handicap match, basically. I'm not going to give the bell to a handicap match. I'm just not going to do it. All right, so let's go to the ladies. We will uh, book ourselves a women's match. We are 0 for 1 tonight. And we have... Well, look at that. Someone mentioned her name. It's like Beetlejuice. You mention her name enough times and she just sort of pops up. Ronda Rousey kicking us off here. Former women's champion, raw women's champion in WWE. Ronda Rousey can be the booker. And Ronda Rousey is going to go one on one with Willow Nightingale. I like that. I like Willow. I, I I like Willow Nightingale. I'm a Willow Nightingale fan. And Ronda Rousey in the ring with the right opponent. Willow Nightingale. It's a fresh match. I think she can get the best out of Ronda Rousey. I wouldn't mind seeing that. So I'm giving that the bell. And now we come down to the main event. This is what it's all about. We are going to book ourselves a WrestleMania-esque main event and so you know cm punk won't be in it because it's the wrestlemania main event but let's see what we land on here we begin with fuck's sake i said wrestlemania main event what the fuck is this why is david arquette on my screen wrestlemania not WrestleMania. I don't believe this. I had high hopes for this match. I had high hopes for that main event. We can't end like that. We can't end like that. I'm I'm the commissioner. I'm coming out. I'm making an executive decision. We're starting over. We're throwing that out, and we're starting over here. Not doing it. Here we go. WrestleMania main event. Ilya Dragunov, the reigning NXT champion. Ilya Dragunov is a fine choice. I don't know that he'll ever be in the WrestleMania main event, but Ilya Dragunov can be in my main event any day of the week. Ilya Dragunov one on one with Roman Reigns, the Tribal Chief, and Ilya Dragunov. That is a very interesting match. Much better than David Arquette. My God, I couldn't let it end that way. I just couldn't do it. So we end up with the Alpha Academy against the Colossal Connection. We end up with Willow Nightingale and Ronda Rousey. And we got Roman Reigns against Ilya Dragunov. Two out of three. I'll take it. Chris says we should get a free redo if we reach a certain number of li Well, I mean, we've got 450 likes, which is nice, but I said 500. We couldn't even get to 500, so I gave that as a freebie. In the future, you're not getting a freebie. <laughs> we can't get to 500. We had almost 1,000 people in here. You ain't getting no freebie next time. So, yeah, if, if you want it, I'll do it, but you got to get those likes up for me. 
All right, let's see. I think there were some other messages that came in here. So let me make sure I don't leave anybody out. Jazz Jackrabbit. Tony Khan absolutely sucks making announcements. AEW needs a front man like Tony. Please send him your CV solo so I never have to see that dweeb on TV again. Uh, so is that just my only job is to go on television and I get to take the, uh, the blame for all the announcements that maybe aren't so big. People will blame me for it. Then instead of blaming him, I get to take the heat. Base Beerus is naked Midian in be the book. No, he is not naked Midian is not in be the booker. I can, that I can confirm. Hey, Justin, have a good night. Nick Grasso, Kota Ibushi has signed with AEW. Tony Khan already put out the graphic. Also, did he put that graphic out tonight? Let's take a look and see. Let us take a look uh, and see. Tony Khan makes it official. The latest star that he has signed is indeed Kota Ibushi. So we know it's not him. On Saturday, since he already went and made the announcement. So there you go. <laughs> this is this is. Uh, I was going to comment on something, but I'm going to keep that to myself. I saw so I saw another piece of news, but uh, I'm not going to say anything about that. I got to be I got to be careful with what I say. Um, okay, but very cool. So Cody Ibushi is with AEW, so I can't wait to see what other big move he knows sells. Wild Bird, every wrestler who's on Be the Booker has to help you in a zombie apocalypse. No, well, we got some we got some good choices in there. I'll be well taken care of then. And Chris Manson, we should get a free redo if we reach a certain number of likes. That was the $4.99. Super chat, Chris, thank you very much. Chris is with us uh, every week here on the streams and uh, Chris you are going to get the last word because we are all out I got all the messages I did indeed so there you go well thank you guys for uh tuning in tonight for the dynamite review this was the go home dynamite before full gear coming up on Saturday and if you missed it for those who may want to go back and check it out my entire slate of full gear predictions is up on the YouTube channel right now you can go and listen, every match on the card, I've got predictions for up on YouTube at the moment. And then, of course, on Saturday, I'm going to be live after SmackDown on Friday. But then on Saturday night, when Full Gear goes off the air, you come back here to the YouTube channel and I will be live for the Full Gear recap. I'm sure it'll be a late night, so you can join me for that. A lot of content coming up. Hopefully you guys will uh, be along for the ride. By the way, we are heading into that time of year where I think Spotify does its wrapped, right? They usually do that around this time at the end of the year. Everybody starts sending me messages about how many hours worth of the sound off they've been listening to all year. So I think Spotify is dropping all the wrapped stuff very soon. So uh, when they do, let me know. We'll see who got we'll see who has the record this year for the number of hours listened to of me. Who has tolerated me for the greatest number of hours in 2023? We'll see who uh, has that record. Joey is going to full gear. Okay, we'll enjoy the show. If you get out of the show and, and I'm streaming live, which I'm sure I will be, you can chime in and uh, let us know how the show was. All right, so uh, Friday night, come on back. We'll do it over again for SmackDown. Until then, be well, stay safe. Oh, wait a minute. We got, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Got some final messages here. We got Base Beer is coming in. Ray is the first U.S. champion to win and lose the title outside of the U.S. Do we get Solo against Cena at WrestleMania? I don't think we are getting John Cena at WrestleMania possible they already have a, a, a verbal commitment, but I think with the uh, strike being over 
and probably a lot of work on his plate now to get to, I, I don't think John Cena is going to have the time to be at WrestleMania this year. So that would be my guess. I'll tell you where he won't be, though. He won't be on SmackDown on Friday, but we'll be here. I'll see you guys Friday night.